every style is good. It depends on the teacher and the practitioner how to make it better. Hey there. Thanks for joining me. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and it's time for episode 206. Today, we're bringing you Soke Newton James, a karate practitioner who started his journey a while ago in Jamaica. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all you returning listeners, and welcome to the new listeners out there. When we set up at martial arts events, I'll sometimes demo our shin guards by shin kicking a nearby door frame full force. No, I'm not a Muay Thai practitioner, and no, I'm not that tough. It's just that our shin guards are that good, and yet they're still not as bulky as most others. Check them out and the rest of what we offer at whistlekick.com. As our show has grown, so has our reach. We're being listened to in more countries, 134 at last count, and we're hearing from more international guests. Today's guest is both international and American, at least when it comes to martial arts. So, okay, Newton James was born in Jamaica, and that's when he found karate. Life finds him in the U.S. now, and we're fortunate enough to have him on the show. Let's welcome him. So, okay, James, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, my brother, and, well, and um, thanks for, for, for this, for oh, this yeah. segment. All, my, all your listeners, good afternoon or good morning, where you are, or, uh, <laughs> good day. Yeah, they could they could be anywhere, it could be any time. This could be 10 years from now. We don't know. Right, right, right. We don't know because we we leave all of the episodes up forever. I mean, okay. and they they have been so far and and people still listen to them even years later because it's not about any point in time. It's about the people that we talk to. You know, we we've talked to a lot of wonderful people, of course. We're honored to have you join that list of people that we get to talk to, that I get to talk to. I mean, this is the best part of my job. Thank you, man. <laughs> well, thank you. But before we go any further, I think it's really important that we get to know you a bit as a martial artist. And the best way to do that, I think, is to tell us how you got started in the martial arts. Okay. Good, 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 good. good. Well, I um, I started back home in Jamaica when I was 13 years old. I was going down the wrong road, and I have a crush on a young lady who lived a little above from me, and I was playing... Me and my guys and we're playing soccer, going down the wrong, you know, I was going down the wrong way. And I called to her and asked her, where is she going? And she said, she's going to YMCA. So I said to her, can I come with you? She said, yes. I said, what are you going to do, dear? She said, I'm going to swim. I said, no, man, come on. I can take you down the river and teach you to swim. She said, no, with me. So I said, okay, I come next week. So next week, come, and I went to her to choose. I went with her. And... When I see you now, with her, I saw everybody swimming. So she said, come on, get your stuff on coming. So I go to get in the water with her, and we swim. And reach about, say, 5, 5 o'clock, 5.30, I hear a noise up on the top floor. And a lot of people were yelling, yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, um, excuse me, Ali, what's that? She said something they call Karachi, you know. Back then, you know, that was in 1968. And and, and, she, and I run, jump out the water at the same time and run up, run up the step. When I go up the step, I stand there at the door, water dropping out from me, and I'm watching the guy, then kick and punch. And at that, that, that time, my mouth just dropped, man. I said, yes, this is for me. So the gentleman who, who, who run the build, building, him, Mr. Dallas, he bring the map on the bucket. The map on the bucket come and give me and said, boy, clean up. So I cleaned up and I asked the instructor, I said, can I come? Can I join you guys? And he said, yes. Class start next week, Tuesday. From there, I went. Next Tuesday, man. I went in my khaki pants and my nice shirt. And from that until this day, I never stopped karate, man. There. I've been all over the world. I'm one of the first person to put my country, Jamaica, in the map, in the state. Then in 1975, now I uh, I was selected. Five of us were selected to represent Jamaica in the first World Martial Art Tournament in Tokyo with the full contact. And uh, five of us went. Uh, we scored the first knockout. One of my other brother, his name is Monty Allen, 
He scored the first knockout in the tournament. He was so fast, he came around, couldn't even catch it. <laughs> so spin kick. So they call us the most rugged karate person they ever see. End up, end up that um, the Japanese, when they we get disqualified in Japanese, they won the 75, by the name Sato. Now, my instructor, named Alan Moncrief, he teach us real hard, man. He was the old school, not nowadays you have little fancy things. Now, the old school, when you leave class, it was like three hours. When you leave class, you crawl it. <laughs> Those are part of my, my way I started. And I, back home, they uh, call us to, when the heads of state come to Jamaica, we are the one who go and hope they show up with a nice demonstration and stuff like that for most, most of the heads of state that come to, come to Jamaica. Um, new prime minister take over, we are the one who help to do the opening ceremony. Cool. So in uh, 1970, uh, I came up to uh, Nakamura, came down to Jamaica. That was my my teacher, teacher Nakamura, mm-hmm. and uh, that was doing Kekushin Kekushin on uh, 14th Street. He came to Jamaica for a demonstration for one of the gentlemen there as my teacher brother. He was the one who was in charge of all of us there. So he leave, but the next person take over. So I came up from Jamaica and I stay and he asked me to, to teach at the headquarters on 23rd Street. And from there, I met the next gentleman named uh, William Oliver, Claude Battle. And from there, my karate take a different hold, in a different direction. Um, more stronger, more better, more techniques. And we started travel all over the world, do um, seminar, tournaments, a lot, a lot of places we went. And, you know, that's, that's how far I am. Today, I'm, I'm in Miami. I leave New York and I moved to Miami. When I moved to Miami in the 90s, I hope my first branch here, uh, Seto Karate. I teach for a while here and then, you know, you move from different place to different place so you can get a lower rate. Then I went up to New York to see my teacher. I went for a job because I was doing a bounty work at the same time. So I went up and uh, we uh, went to see him and he have, we have a disagreement. And I came back and I leave that's in 2000, 2003. And I 2004, I leave Seto Karate and create my own, which is a, a Kekushin mixed with the Basai. Basai is point and circle which is more street, just the way you walk, uh, just like oh, you, will, you will see a policeman stand, that's, what, that's my stance. So that's what I, I create that and call it uh, Masai Kekushin. Hmm. Well, from that, back in New York, I uh, have several books that I'm in. First one is uh, Karate Illustrated, that's magazine with Bill Wallace on the cover. Next, next one in 1991, um, September 91, we have the best, uh, best martial arts. In 93, I have fighting martial arts. In November of, 90, of 89, 81, we have official karate magazine with me and William Malibu on the cover. In September 1986, I have American Karate Illustrated. December 89, Master in Karate. And uh, several other magazines that um, I'm in, you know, over the years. You've received some recognition for, for all your hard work, it seems. Yes. That that are uh, that are you're pretty and people like putting you on the cover of magazines. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm on the cover, I'm on the, the middle, the middle. And then in uh, 2008, I was inducted in the World Martial Arts of Fame in um, Cornell University of State New York. 
um, that's when I had a in in uh, put me in the with the ranks of Judah uh, Demura and all the other different others as Soki. Mm. Good company. And I traveled the world all over, competing. Just came back from uh, South Africa, where uh, one of my other brothers there teaching me to do a seminar and uh, and help teach some of the police officers close quarter tactics. So those are those are my I uh, would say um, recognition, and I'm still still getting awards and stuff like that for my contrib- contribution to teaching kids in schools and stuff like that. I'd, I'd like to go back to, to yes. a little bit and talk about when you were a kid, because we, we kind of, we kind of move quickly through, through this moment. But for me, I think it's a really yep. significant moment. Okay. When I You're at the a, YMCA in, and yeah, you, you well, heard the karate upstairs and you went up the stairs and you saw them and you said your jaw dropped and you knew it was for you. Yes. How did you know? Well, the reason why I know is that this is for me because right away I never see nothing like this. I never know that I can use your hands and your legs like what I would see the guys them doing. And I know that the skill that I have by playing soccer, running, doing all those things, I could be I could challenge everything into that because I was going into the game at that time, in my neighborhood. You know? Mm. I grew up without a mother and a father. And I have to take care of my four four other sisters okay. and brothers. So, from that that point of view, I said, no, you know, this is the road that I want to take. And and from that, you know, it, it gets, uh, I teach my sisters, I teach some of my brothers, my friends, Little that I knew at that time, you know, I, I, when I, when I was in the, the class training, you stand one place in what you call a sanction and you will do a thousand punches, a thousand black, you know, and uh, <laughs> some people quit, some people stay. Yeah. Because kick pushing is a very hard style. It's the, the strongest style, style in the world. As you might know, uh, you read up on all the martial artists around the world, you know, Masayama is the first person that killed a bull with bare hand. Yes, he is well known for that. I, we've even, um, yeah. I've seen video, there's some very grainy video out there of, of him at one of his final bullfights. Okay, well, you know, he was one of the leading top person in the world, and I know that before, long before um, Bruce Lee come aboard and stuff like that, you know, he challenged the world. He challenged the world. In my days, then when I was a little boy, I hear what's going on when I just started, hear what's going on and stuff like that. You know, he challenged the world. But nobody never take him up on the challenge at that time, you know. So those are the things that uh, push me, mm. you know, when I hear little things. From people who come to the state and come back, and they're talking about at the YMCA, talking about martial arts and stuff like that. You know, it put me to be smaller myself and be stronger within what I'm doing at that time. Sure. Okay. As I already told you, you know, I I yeah. love hearing stories from the guests, and if you've spent so much time in martial arts and traveling the world and working with, I mean, just legendary people as you've already named. I'm sure you've got some great stories. Could I trouble you to tell yeah. us one of your favorites? Uh, one of my favorite stories that, well, me and William Oliver, we went to uh, India. Uh, the people who raised me from when I was a kid, I, from when I was uh, nine years old, are Indian. They're from India. And they teach me their language, which is Hindustani. So we have put the, they put a team together for me to go to uh, go to India to compete. And I go there, and there is a couple guys there who come and say to me, um, "Let's go over here and 
will explain to you. And I, some of them speak English and some speak um, Hindu. So I respond to them in Hindu. And they look at me like I'm sick. <laughs> because I never see, uh, never hear a black person, like, even though they're dark like me, they don't know, they don't, they, they, they're so shocked to see a black brother speaking their language just like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we go out and talk. Then it take me to a, a little underground club where they have a heart, almost like Salat, but it's not Salat. They, they, they call it Pakwa, old Pakwa, out of, out of Africa. Mm-hmm. Ancient, ancient. So they kick low, like in your ankles. They step on top of your foot, you know. They kick you in the knee, you know, they kick you in the waist. All giants, they hit you. And then they use the, the uh, light color stick, but it's not color stick. The knife that they use is curvy. I don't, I don't remember the name right now. Is it like a, a karambit? Almost like that. Almost okay. like that. Yes. And I was t- astonished, man, to see these Indian ladies, Indian guys, training, doing this. All the people, man. Guy, beard, lung, catching down and waist, and he's moving like a nine year, ten, a ten year old kid. You know? So I, I was marveled to see that. And I say to all of them, man, I can't stop karate, man. Look at these old guys. And then we could also limber. I think probably we're eating the wrong food, you know, and stuff like that. So at that time, when we came back now, and uh, I said to myself, stop eating meat. So I cut meat out of my diet completely. Um, I eat a pot, you know, what, uh, 19 years now, no meat. Wow. Yeah. You know, and um, even this day, I, I still correspond with two other people, two of my friends there in India. They're dying for me to come back. You know, <laughs> I have to get the funds to go. <laughs> but it's nice. Mm. Yeah, that's one. That's Next cool. one, uh, I went to, uh, we went to to Europe and we meet uh, Andy Hub. And he is from France, and he was one of Kikushin top fighters there. And he we went and see the tournament, and then you know they all of a compete. I I didn't fight, but I just do forms, and I win my forms. And I was in a middleweight division, and the guy pick up his leg and hit this guy with a roundhouse kick, man, and he was flip over and drop on his face. <sighs> That's how powerful the run of it was. You know, he was terrific. Then he hit, he, next fight, he hit the guy with an axe kick. Break the guy collarbone, man. Mm. This guy was a beast. That's, that's, that's the next one. And um, he had to grab a picture for me and he come back. Otherwise, there's so much stuff that I have in my head. <laughs> I'm sure. Ridiculous. Pick them out. You've been training a long time. There, there's, there are bound to be a lot of stuff in your head. But next, uh, next year, Jan, next year, February, going to be 50 years. I'm in the art. Wow. How does that feel? When, when uh, you think, when you think about your life in, in that way, to say that you've done one thing for 50 years, how does that make you feel? Great, man. Great, great, great. I think God bless me with good genetics. Bless me, um, give me the incense to, or uh, the sense to eat right, keep my body right, no drinking, no smoking, sleep right, and take care of myself, you know, and keep me on the right path. You know, I, I think Father blessed me with that, with that, and I keep on praying for, pray, praying that He might keep me, keep, keep me going for a lot, lot, lot more times, you know. Mm. Um, December coming out the 67 years old and I'm still going. How has your training changed? I mean, if you're, if you're doing something for 50 years, you're probably doing it yeah. differently now than, than you used to. What's, what's different yeah. about the way you train? Yeah. Now I do more pint and circle, more circle. I stretch still. I still do my sit up, my leg lifts and 
You know, I don't do no all the high stuff that I usually do, high kicks and jumps and stuff like that. I don't do no more. You know, I might I will demonstrate things to you, but I don't do those. You know, I do. I hit the bag. I hit the. Bag. I work with my guys. We fight. You know, we kick to the ties, ties and kick to the calf. You know, we kick. You know, very knee kicks, all the different kicks you can think of. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't do no flashy, flashy jump, jumps and stuff like that. Like first time, you know, first time when you're younger, you you do all the fancy stuff and flips and all this stuff. I don't do those no more, you know. Elbows and knees and stuff like that, those squat and stuff that I do. And I also teach um, most of the police officers, the gang unit in Miami and some of the uh, some of the, the the SWAT teams. You know, teach them the close quarter and stuff for uh, the street. Hmm. Okay. I'm always curious of that. You know, I'm 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 certainly older than I was when I when I started martial arts. I'm I'm not. You know, I certainly haven't been training for fifty years either. So I always enjoy asking that question and finding out. You know what what might be in store. What wisdom do do the veteran masters have to share with us about training as you get older? And so yeah, I appreciate when, that. When you don't, you don't. You find, say, your knee hurt, your hips hurt, you know, um, your elbows hurt, your neck hurt, your shoulders hurt, mm-hmm. you know. So what to, what to do, and this is what I do to compensate, to build the muscles over my bones, over my bone, back, um, because I'm also uh, um, exercise physiology. Mm-hmm. What I do, I mix the, the weight, light weight, with everything that I do. I will go to the gym and I will take a workout. Uh, I will do my thing. Then, you know, you go hit the bag, you stretch. You still make the body limber, but you don't do the fancy stuff that the usual do, you know. You kind of sit down as you get as you get older because the body, the joints, them going to hurt, you know, because we, as we get older, we lose, lose that 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 muscle and that flexibility. So it, if it's you as a older person want to continue, you have to take your time and stretch. Don't force it, you know, just to balance the body right. Makes sense. Yes, sir. Other than martial arts and, and, and exercise, I guess, in general, are there, do you have any hobbies? Are there things that you enjoy outside of martial arts? Well, outside of martial arts, I, I work, I work, I use, I do bone to work for about what seven years in Florida and um, New York, uh, go Jersey, all over the place. And I do bodyguard work. I teach. I also teach the bodyguard. Well, when I came to Miami, I um, I went to do some bouncing work just to get my foot in Miami and get some more dollars to help do what I got to do. I went and find a job on the beach, South Beach, as a bouncer. One of the gentlemen was there um, named Tony Garcia. We were talking and he said, hey, you know, my father is an investigator. So I said, what? And I said, yes, I would like to meet him. So two days later, I go and meet his father and we talk. And from there, we start to get into the story. Said, Why don't you come and um, take a class? And I go and take the investigation class. I go and I get licensed up and everything. It takes me about two weeks to finish up all the training and uh, paperwork and stuff like that. Send him to the state and I get my license. And I start to work with him too. And work at a club downtown called Pacha. Where I work with police officers and stuff like that. And I, after a while, I stopped that and just started to do just investigation. Then he tell me that he have a friend up in uh, Fullerdale, name is um, Bruce Siddle. Bruce Siddle was an ex Marine, and he created his own body tactics. So he asked me, "You want to come? Let's go see, see see Bruce." So we went up to see Bruce, and he said, "Okay, James, come on. I will teach you. This is what it's going to cost you. I know." You can pay me this, pay me that. I said, okay, sir. And we start training. 
and I trained with him for a year and a half. In the bodyguard, I worked on pro squatter tactics and uh, over teach, over teach police officer, you know, pro squatter, twist in the street, how to walk. It's the same thing with the bodyguard. So what I do, I start, after I get licensed up with bodyguard work and train with a couple of the other top guys, then they teach me how to scale up a bit on the side of the building. You know, mm. up and down and and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, and teach me how to extract. So over the years, I work with a lot of different different organizations. I work with um, I work with some big government for a while. I can't go into that, <laughs> but you know, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go. I won't go into that part. Those must that. those must be some really good stories if you can't tell them. <laughs> yes, I can't into that part where I work. With but I worked with the government for a while in that. And uh, um, I can just send secret service. Just that. Mm-hmm. Sure. Can't go any other, any other way. I understand. Right? But uh, I teach a lot of, I teach a bodyguard work and I do a lot of bodyguard work. I work with the models. I work with uh, most of the guys in Jamaica who come to Miami to do shows. Mm-hmm. And uh, travel with some of them in different different places. Oh, fun! Yeah. So you've probably you've my, met a lot of great people, I'm sure, than than yeah. through bodyguard work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of great people. I meet, talk with them, and you know, they know me. And uh, sometimes I go undercover. I work at the airport for a while, undercover work, and about building up my uh, airport. You know, I put a lot of people in jail. Mm. Like you say, you come into Miami, okay. and you you come and you going back, and you at that time you couldn't close your bag after nine eleven, you couldn't close your bag, mm-hmm. and you have guys who go in your bag and take your things out. By the time you reach your destination, your stuff was not there, you know. So my job was to find those people who do that, work with them, see what they're doing, and put them in jail. Mm. That's one part of uh, the other hobby I do. Mm-hmm. Now I just teach. I, I teach and I do uh, teach some of the bodyguard work. I do investigation too, to just to help the family and stuff like that. You know. Sure. Otherwise, I'm okay. Everything is good so far. There's certainly yes. a, a connection in the physical aspect of bodyguard yes. work and martial arts, but what about the the mental side? The mental side, you what you have to do is, as a as a martial artist and go into into that kind of uh, environment. Before you go out there, you have to do your meditation, get your mind set for what you are ready to bark on. So you never know. You have to be prepare your mind and your body. You have to prepare your mind and your body for the right the right environment out there. So and be we. At all time when you're there, so those are the, those are the things that you, you know I I do. Certain people probably don't don't do that, but when I'm going out in the night, when I'm doing my bound to work, I usually come knock upon your door at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I prepare myself before I come to you. You know, I have my vest and I have my weapons, everything on me, and I'm ready to take you take you in. So, but I don't I don't to you if I talk to you very nicely. So if I come to your door and I knock upon your door and, I, and you say, who is that? And I said, open your door. Da, 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 da. No, that's not. That's the confrontation there. What I do, I come to your door and I said, I knock upon your door and you say, who is that? And I explain myself what I'm there for and who I am. And you will open the door and I, and I talk to you nicely. And that's how I take it from there. I don't go like some people get crazy and they get themselves killed. Has that always been your approach to that work? That's always been my approach. Nicely. Nicely. If I come to your home in the morning, at that time when you're sleeping, and you jump out of your bed, and you hear me knock on your door, and I come with a very rude attitude, you're not going to open your door. You're going to pop at your weapon and want to shoot me. 
that you stayed in the gun state, right. you know, so because I'm on your property. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> you know, so I come very nicely, you know, talk to you nicely, and then we we'll go from there. Ninety-nine percent of the people that I go for always come peacefully, and then I explain to them why they're going, what and what, why they do this to themselves. Try to help them to get back on their feet, you know, with a positive attitude. Cool. And I always get compliments after after they come out, and so on. They will call me and come and compliment me for talking to them in a very nice way. So they can help take care of themselves. And that's how I approach, I approach it, man. I don't want to approach it like, so, like these other people. What, where did that approach come from then? Because, I mean, just my understanding is that's very uncommon in that work. Yeah. Did someone teach you that way, or is that just the way you no, grew up? No, not directly. No, it comes from my uh, humbleness, humbleness in the art. You know, you didn't have anything to prove. As as my instructor always said, said, try to help each other, come together. You know, you train hard, play hard, but at the end of the day, you come together and be nice to people. You know, you always restore that on us. You know, and some of my some of my uh, people who I train with sweat the next next to don't don't feel like that. But that's my that's my way and how I grew up in the island. Mm. I take up martial art. Makes sense. You know, when you when you take up martial art um, in the island, you have a different mindset because the teachers is restoring that discipline on you. You know, you come in late, you do push-ups, a lot of push-ups. You know, and if you do anything wrong, you do push-ups, a lot, a lot of push-ups. You do push-up until your home. Your, your bicep solid, <laughs> you know, or you do something bad, then everybody everybody take turns and beat you up. <laughs> so <laughs> next day you want to come back. So those are the the, the discipline that was to open us in the heart from back home coming. We've heard some good stories already from you today. And one of the things I'm curious, you know, you you strike me as a very positive person. All the stories you've told, you, I, I can almost hear the smile on your face as you're telling them. Yes, 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 yes. yes <laughs> I'm you're sure. So right. Sorry. Yeah, just say so you're so you're so right. <laughs> I'm sure there are times in your life where you weren't smiling, though. I mean, we all have those. And I'm yeah, curious yeah, if yeah. you'd tell us about a time where things didn't go well and you were able to use your martial arts training to to get past yes. it. Whether that's physical or mental, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, my first uh, kid mother. When I moved from New York, come down, you know, I usually teach all over the city in New York. I work at YMCA, work at the United, United Nations with Indian ambassador from India because I speak the Hindustani and I help him translate and bring the letter all over the place in the United Nations. So that money that I make here, the paycheck, I usually put it in the stock market. So when the stock market was going to crash back in the, uh, the 90s, 89, the, I take out my money before that and I come to Miami here and I bought, we bought a home. Bought a home and I'm traveling, you know, just open up the dojo and she wasn't working, she do she doesn't work, she didn't work for five years. So the saving that we have we live after that. And the dojo that I open we start make some money and stuff like that. Now we have a hurricane here near Manjo. You come and mess up the place and stuff like that. We get some money fixed by the house and everything. All right. Now she usually worked for Calvin Klein when she lived in New York. So her girlfriend him came down um, I have, we have a son. That's my first son. And she decides to wear right now. She, um, she want to go out and so on. I said, all right, you go. I'm teaching in the dojo and my son is on my shoulder. So she can go out and party with her girlfriend. 
So the girls that they came down, one or two times when they buy it, one of them buy a house up in Florida Dale. I said, all right. I go up and see her and, you know, we hang out for a little while and so on. I went to Japan and then I, when I come back, uh, she said to me, uh, she want to move. And I said, why do you want to move? She said she want to go up here and maybe live up in a... I told her that, listen, we cannot move at this time because we, I affect so many other kids' lives. Yeah. And she said, well, she want to, she want to go. So I said, all right, you want to go, what do you want to do? And we have a little fuss, like, we have a little talk. Uh, she raised her voice on me. I raised my voice on her. And she stepped to me, like, said she want to fight me, so I step away. And I leave. I go up my dojo and I sleep. And I come back in the morning and I tell her, I said, listen, take the apps. Do what you want to do. I take my clothes and then I move to my dojo. Then she sell the house and move away, man. Move to Florida Day. And I sleep on my dojo floor for five years. Five years? Bring myself back. And I, every morning I wake, I pray to Father, bring me back on my feet. And that's what happened. So that's a low part down in my in my I from my karate. But my karate never stopped, you know? Never stop, never stop. What would it take to make you stop at this point? Uh, this this uh, I don't know if I could stop. I don't see nothing out there to make me stop do what I'm doing. Because there's so many kids out there so many people out there to educate, educate in the heart, show them the right way, and to help them to let their, their let their martial art help them to be better in school, you know, and be a better role model. You know, those are the things that I look at. That's why I can't stop the karate, because I see what it do for me in my life. You know, it make me open my eyes to see the world. You know, uh, and I would love my student to see do the same thing and new student whole student to travel compete you know i remember my um several of my students were number one in florida for uh, seven nine years all over the place they go compete and they go to the tournament they get trophy and don't even break a sweat you know <laughs> because they say they hit these my kids they hit too hard you know and it's not hit they hit hard, but that's they have the right the right training and the right way yeah. of doing things. Wow. During all your travels you certainly got a chance to meet quite a few people and, and train with them and you know, you mentioned some great names already. But if you had the opportunity to train with someone that you never did, and, and that can be someone that's alive today or someone that, that died a hundred years ago, who would you want to train with? I would like to train with a brother named Mr. Doe. He's in Okinawa. He's one of the top Okinawan fighters and practitioners. He he, he was uh, he was Miyazaki teacher and Fude Domura teacher back then in the old days. But he passed away now. Father bless his soul. But if I if I have the chance, and he was alive. That's the person that I would go like to train with. But guys, he put a lot of influence on the heart from Okinawa throughout the world. This guy, he traveled. And the next person that I would like to train with, even though we're friends, is Miyazaki. Why? Why him? Miyazaki and Sufude Kimura. Those are the, because those guys have so many passion. Passion for what they do. Means um, Fudu Dumura have two heart attack, and he's still going. Yeah. Still going, man. I love that brother, man. You know, I have a lot of teachers um, from Sugaru Yama, Nakamura, Kishi, William Oliver, um, Claude Butler. You know, these are some of the top guys, and you know. Um, the Nomia up in uh, the Nomia in Colorado, there, Joko Nomia, where inch karate. Hmm. 
he was one of the seven guys who came up when I came up from Jamaica way back when when the Kekushin was at 14th Street. He's one of the guys who beat living tomorrow to me. And the other guys there, they wiped the floor with us. They call him the seven samurai. <laughs> you know, so those are some good, good martial artists that I that I I admired. Yeah. I would love to train with some of those guys, you know. Mm. But uh Malibu, we William Malibu, we travel all over and uh God Father bless his soul. He's like uh oh my father man, he's he's my mentor. Because if it wasn't him you know, I didn't get, wouldn't get to see the world like how oh, I've seen it now, because we travel so much and compete. Some, some of the tournaments we won, some we lost, some they disqualify us. You know, some, sometimes I go some tournament as a black person, person spit at me, because, you know. But I, and when time come, I get up. They call me name, I get up and I knock him out. <laughs> <laughs> those are the, those are the things. You know, I go to tournament, I go to tournament, spend my money, go, and at like one o'clock in the morning, I'm fighting. <laughs> you know, so those are the crazy stuff that go on, man. But, you know, I love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. I, I wouldn't give up nothing for my art, man. Hmm. We had uh, Grandmaster Victor Moore on the show uh, over a year ago. I, I don't know if you know him. Yes, 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 um, yes. Great, and, but he... Yes, and and he talked about going to tournaments where, you know, it was the '60s, and and he was a black yeah, man in America yeah. in the '60s, and yeah. he was defending uh-huh. his title, but they still made him go yeah. in the back door. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, man. Hmm. They still do that, man. They still do that. I remember I went to a tournament up in uh, Quebec, a little place called Newtown, and at that place there is only. He has so many jails there. He's really, if you're not a police officer, not a correction officer, or uh, in law enforcement, you can't live in that town. Mm. You know, we in America here, we pay Canadian to take care of our prisoner there. <laughs> we don't know that, but that's what happened. So, and there's a brother there. I don't know if you know him, George Finesse. Mm. He's, a, he's a top fighter. I, you know. Yeah. When I live in New York, we uh, I went to the Battle of Atlanta. At that time, Joe Coley was the man who was in charge of ESPN and stuff like that back yeah. then. Yeah. And he had a tournament there called Battle of Atlanta. They still have it. And we go, we won part of a tournament and so on. But Gene Finesse now, he had a tournament up in, up in Quebec, a place out there called New, Newtown. So he invited us. He saw my name in the back of the magazine. And he invited me to come. So me and Oliver go. And, you know, I, I'm not a prejudiced guy because yes. in my country, we don't see skin color. Everybody mix up together, you know. It's only when I come to this country, I see people like uh, they don't like each other, they this and that. But, you know, I don't care. But the thing is this, what, what happened when he invited us and we go, you know, tournament starts from 9 o'clock in the morning. You can imagine one, two o'clock in the morning you're fighting. Yeah. You're performing Ugh. after you've been there, after you've been there for two days already. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So they make us for the last man. And yeah, these guys they come around and they look at you like, you know, look at you like they want to kill you. So what I do when they come around and going on, I just smile. I just smile. Because I know these guys are the bullies. So when they call me up to fight, I go up and I stand up with George and he said, Who's? Then they call this guy name and the guy do two flips and come over. <laughs> you know, he was a gymnast. He said, do two flips and come stand up in front of me. And he have a mask on. And my brother, when he judge, when I bow to the judge and they were about him and sat up and the judge said, Begin. My back leg round house kick, man. Straight in his face, man. Knock him out cold. <laughs> Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up in the arena, stand up and clap, you know, because it's a group of guys that they bully, they bully people. Mm. You know? Everybody get up and clap, man. So that's for sure you say, well, listen, you know, when you go to some of these places, you have 
people who don't like you and you have people who like you. So, and after the tournament, you know, they take, they take me out, they take us out for dinner. All the guys, they take us out for dinner, didn't they? And we talk to them, tell them we weren't coming from home, but, you know, that in my country, we have white, black, you know, Syrian, Jews, everybody, we mix up together. We don't see skin color, you know? So they were surprised when I say that to them, you know? They say, they were, what? They said, yes, we don't, we don't see none of that, man. You know? We don't see no white, we don't see no black. We are one people. <laughs> so they were, they were so surprised when I, you know, so they buy me dinner, buy me drinks, take, take us back in the car to the to a hotel. <laughs> it was fantastic, man. Maybe someday we'll get to that point in the rest of yes, the world yes. that we don't see skin color. We can hope. Yeah. I hope so, man. I hope so. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah man. But everything is, you know, it's, it's uh, as an individual, it's you as a person to see that, hey, if I cut your hand, you bleed just like me. You know? Blood is the same. It's not, it's not a green blood or a blue blood. <laughs> it's coming out really the same way. So, I don't see none of that. I love all people, brother. Mm. We are far more alike than we are different, and even within the martial arts, yes. I think that yeah. different arts are True. far more alike than different. Yes, 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 yes. So, even uh, uh, Masayama was a Korean, and the way he get his name is from uh, Shiro Royama. Royama family invite them over when the war and they came over and for him to go to school they must have give him a name. He couldn't give him a Korean name. If he's Japanese they kill him right away kill him right away. They have to give him a Japanese name. So that's that's why he and uh, Oyama, Sugar Oyama, like later like brothers. I did that's not know I that. Used. That's huh. Yeah. I, I've never heard that story. Oh that's I'm gonna have to do some research. That's cool. Uh, Next time we talk, I, I will give you a little more history on that part. Okay. Okay, sure. And then you have Nakamura now, was the youngest, youngest uh, shodan that Masayama and Oyama trained to go to Thailand to beat, to fight the, uh, the Thai boxers. He was the only man in history to beat all the Thai boxers back then. We've heard a lot about, you know, where you are and, and where you've been. I'm wondering about where you're going. You know, if, if you're you're still training, you're still teaching. You've you've told us about how important it is passing on the karate knowledge that you've gained to people. What are your goals? Are, are there is there anything that you're looking into the future, saying I want to accomplish this at yes. some point? Okay, t- tell us about those things. The reason why I create Basai, Basai is more like your body. Your body is the fortress, and to know the body properly and how it, how it, um, how the body moves and how you can help your body to grow better and how you can help somebody to grow better. That's what Basa is all about. It means the body is a fortress. If somebody steps in, you're going to break down, you're going to break down their body. So that's how I, how I teach that and that's what Basa means. Mixed with the key cushion, it's more rounded with pint and circle more stronger. So what I did, I tried to pass it on to a lot of people. I want to have branches in different, different places. Right now I have five branches in my country, in Jamaica. Um, I have one in New York and then um, the Arizona branch now that um, my brother called you from and talked to you. Um, we're working together to come together to make something better. So that's 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 where I want wanted to go. And I want to go out and educate the kids and in schools, you know. And I hope I hope in my in my country right now I would love for um to to have all the making a curriculum in school, karate, you know, so you have less violence, less crime through the different way. Mm. You know, that's that's my goal. That's my goal. The the um, when the class was going to Jamaica in, in um, July, in July, to talk to the minister, 
and the Minister of Education to see what we could do. And you see this country, anyhow, this country did and that martial art from World War II or one. This country would be so good, man, because I don't know what you know. You don't know what I know, so we're not going to fight. And that's also part that's a Japanese principle. You start out with the young kids in school. Once you educate them the right way, you teach them the art and right discipline, there will be no crime, man. You know, I don't say some people won't, won't go to your pocket or so on, but there will be less crime, less people want to try to hurt you. If people are listening and they want to get a hold of you or find you online or come train with uh, you, how would they do that? They, they, um, well, I have a website, okay. calbasamiami.com. Uh, if you Google me, Google Newton James, I come up. If you Google Basai Kekushin, it come up. And I advertise a lot. People from all over the world called me. Matter of fact, to last night, one of my students called me from Afghanistan. Oh, wow. You know? And thanking me for thanking me for what I teach. Teaching. He saved his life yesterday. Yeah. His name is Joe. Hmm. And, um, you know, I have people from all over the world, all over from Russia to Afghanistan to India, all over calling me, man. But, you know, we, I'm just one person and I'm just humble for this moment that we're talking and for the blessing that Father restore upon me so I can give my vision. And finally, before we sign off here, how about some final words for the people listening? Any, any good advice for them? To so all the martial arts, artists who listen to this program, give thanks. Find if you are, if you train, talk to your teacher, tell him your mind, tell him where would you like to improve your karate. If you kick that properly, ask him questions because he's your instructor. He's supposed to teach you the right way how to kick, how to block, how to do your martial art practice and you practice at home. You can't just wait until you go to dojo to practice. You gotta practice at home so you improve. Improve on your on what you do. You know, if you do taekwondo, if you do goju, you should do whatever you you care what, what the style is. Every style is good. It depends on the teacher and the practitioner how to make it better. And the person the teacher give you the tool. You have to build your house. You have to build your house so your house is very compact and very good. And how to talk to people, how you respect people, not be arrogant, you know, about teaching. For every day I teach my kids, I learn from them. I learn something new. I fight with them, I learn something new because I got to move. If they don't move, they're going to keep me in my grind. I move around. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And they punch your face, they will stick you in the eye. So you have to you learn something new every day. You, if you're even walking in the street, so you go down downtown New York, you know, you see so many people, you learn something. You know, you learn how they walk, you see the body language. The person coming to you. One of my, uh, when I back home, I was teaching uh, the military. One of my things that I usually do, you know, we take them downtown, like in the midday, 12 o'clock, where we have so many people. And I said, listen, this is what you're going to do. For my teacher teach me this, this is what I want you to do. You're going to go straight down. The person is coming to you. You're not going to come out the way. If you come out the way, you fail this drill. When you go back to the doors, you're going to do push-up. Let's see that person coming to you. Let that person walk away from you. If one person touch you, you fail. And you, at the same time you're going, you're going and you see that person coming, you better read that person. Look him in the eye, read from his head to his toes, see his body language. If he's going to hurt you, you're going to step out of the way. You're supposed to know that as a martial art. So those are the things that I used to upon my student too, you know. And I would love for all the martial art, the martial art practitioner that listening to this program will continue to listen to, the, to this program and contribute to this program for what this gentleman is doing so far is 
is broaden our mind to different things and to listen to different people point of view from all over the world. We love you guys. Stay strong and be true to yourself at all times. I couldn't get over Soki James' warmth and intense love for martial arts. I love martial arts, and I'd say all of our guests do too. But there was something about speaking with Soki that made me excited about training. Thank you, Soki James, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with some photos and links to his website and social media. Find Whistlekick on social media, at Whistlekick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We're on YouTube. We're on Pinterest. Uh, I don't think we have a MySpace account, and we probably never will. <laughs> you can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Get yourself a pair of great shin guards, and you can impress your friends by kicking door frames like me. All right, that's all for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>